From New York, extracting the signal from the noise, it's the Cube, covering Spark Summit East, brought to you by Spark Summit. Now your hosts, Jeff Frick and George Gilbert. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We are live in Midtown Manhattan for the Spark Summit East 2016. I think it's the second year that Spark's been in New York. It's a really growing event, really. The, the Hilton Midtown, which has a lot of big data events, so we're kind of at the birthplace of what was Strata World and Hadoop World, and now really Spark is kind of the next wave of innovation. So we're excited to be here, bring, the, bring you all the action. I'm joined uh, in this segment by uh, Wikibon Big Data and Analytics Analyst, George Gilbert. Welcome, George. Good to be here, Jeff. Oh, so you that's my cue. That's your cue. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> All right, so we're, <laughs> we're taking it around the table. So we have Anand from Stream Analytics, and Anand, I'm not going to butcher your last name, so I'm going to let you introduce um, that part of <laughs> that part and tell us, tell us what, what's new with Stream Analytics. So am I looking there? Yeah. So um, my name is Anand Venugopal. I'm uh, the head of product for Stream Analytics which is uh, at Impetus Technologies. The, the company that brings to you the product called Stream Analytics is uh, Impetus Technologies. So as, as many of you might know already, Stream Analytics is a real-time streaming analytics platform designed for enterprise usage that's based on open source technologies. Right? And we're very excited to announce that um, we, we just announced our 2.0 product that's based on Spark Streaming. And with that announcement, what that makes us is the industry's only multi-engine streaming analytics platform. So you saw what Databricks is doing in terms of Spark, they're strengthening Spark for streaming, increasing the performance, increasing more ease, ease of use, things like that. Um, but as far as enterprise users are, are uh, concerned, they, they really need a much more abstract, easy to use type of interface with drag and drop you know, buttons and uh, visual IDE, right? And they need that environment independent of what technology it is. They just cannot keep up with the number of different technologies coming up. They, they can't keep up with the speed of innovation. Right. So they really need one common abstract abstraction. For streaming. For streaming. Okay. That enables them to build streaming applications on any chosen engine. Because the different there are different use cases, right? There are low latency use cases. There are use cases that are suitable for batch or micro batch. So you want to do with Storm, great. Use the same interface, build a Storm pipeline, deploy it into Storm. You want to do a Spark streaming pipeline, build it, same interface, build it, deploy it to Spark streaming. And even better, you can start interconnecting multiple subsystems based on different engines using, using you know, queuing and other technologies, again, visually, right? So you build a pre-processing, maybe module with Storm, you build a machine learning module with, with Spark streaming, Inter interconnect those two and build more complex real-time pipelines with multiple, multiple technologies, right? The, the biggest thing here is we want to enable enterprises to focus on the business value right. and the application layer. Not for them to be frozen about, oh, which engine do I pick? Am I, if I pick this engine, am I going to get stuck with it because it's going to be the wrong engine six months down the line? So we want to really take them up a level in terms of uh, abstraction, right? And say, focus on your application, focus on the business impact, just take it for granted that you have the right technology under this platform. You have you know, the most favorite technology, whatever it is. Today, it's Spark Streaming, right? It was Storm, it's now Spark Streaming, we got both, and who knows, two or three quarters down the line, there could be another one, right? So or maybe more. tell us, tell us um, first, before we get into which engine, you know, or why, tell us the class of um, applications that you see coming up that, uh, you know, that's pushing customers towards essentially faster and faster reaction or lower latency. Yeah. Why, why is that happening mm -hmm. now? Um, what are the first applications? So um, there are two classes of applications. One I would say is customer analytics. Okay. Anything to do with improving the customer experience, delivering much more context sensitive real time service, which literally surprises or even delights the customer, right? Hey, how did you know that? I was calling about this, but you already knew this. Oh, it was great, right? Customer analytics is one large category. Operational intelligence is, in general is another large category, right? Where again, you have security, you have you know, predictive maintenance, you have just 
maintenance and monitoring of different systems and things like that. Well, yeah, your systems itself, like. Systems the, itself, yeah. yeah. Predictive maintenance and, and of course IT log monitoring, right. right, all of that. So there's very, there's, um, from a business value point of view, we classify it into three or four layers based on business impact, right? When you're trying to protect your assets and minimize losses, right, that's more preventive and predictive type of use cases where you're doing predictive maintenance and security. Even preventing a customer that's going to churn in some ways is actually protecting an asset or reducing a loss, right? So that's preventing losses, okay? And as you know, if, if things go bad, these, these losses can, can make CIOs lose jobs, people, companies like you know, Target loses tens of millions of dollars in data breaches and things like that. Right. So um, that category of applications is critical. It's, it's basic table stakes, right? The next is routine operations, or more profitable operations, uh, which mu with much better optimization, right? Let's say you're, you're optimizing network traffic. You're, you're making much more optimal use of your network with, without, and you're avoiding like a $50 million CapEx upgrade just by optimizing your current infrastructure based on real-time analytics. That's routine operations, right? Tracking, tracking a fleet and, and making the best use of all your trucks and all of that. So those are routine operations. The third category, which gets into the more sexy domain, is, is adding new, getting new, finding new sources of revenue, right? Um, whenever a customer is ready to buy something and you just are not offering that because you don't, enough, you don't have enough information in the moment of truth, you're not able to offer something that the customer would buy, that's a missed opportunity for revenue. Real-time streaming analytics would come in right there at that point and say, context sensitively, when I'm engaged with Jeff at this point, get all the information about Jeff that I possibly can and put, the, put it in front of the agent so that I can offer you the right product that you want to buy. We are, our CEO, uh, Dave Vellante, was talking about that um, earlier this morning um, in terms of uh, uh, vendors being, uh, first, you know, consumers got more and more information about vendors and so they had pricing power, but now vendors are collecting more and more information about consumers. Is that process of gathering context about a customer, <laughs> does that ever end? You know, or are you, is the vendor always in a better position to offer something, um, whether it's better experience or better product or service, if they have more and more information about that, that end customer? I guess there is an end point where you could say there's no, there's no future context enrichment possible, but it's yeah. many, many years away, I think. Many, many years away. So it is a, it's an evergreen process. It is an evergreen process at this time, okay. right? Because Life is constantly ongoing, right? You, two, two weeks down the line, my situation changed. Something happened in my life that you, as a seller to me, right. ought to know. So it's a constant ongoing process. But yeah, and the other yeah. piece is the nuance, right? I think the nuance can only get better with more sophisticated tools, and more better information, better algorithms, because somebody once said, you know, done, done, uh, done poorly, it's creepy. You right. know, <laughs> done well, it's magic. So, exactly. you know, what is the exactly. nuance between the creepy and the magic to put the, the right offer in front right. of me at the right time? Right. Often, see, the, this whole argument about creepy and privacy becomes uh, irrelevant sometimes because I am engaging with, let's say you're a bank, let's say you're a telco, right? I went and put information on your website. I called your call center. I gave you my data from a provisioning interface whenever I did. So all the information I voluntarily gave you and you are not able to correlate all of the information I gave you voluntarily, right? And so there's a huge value add that's still yet to be done by companies just in centralizing and converging all their information. That's in the data lake scenario. It's already it's, there in the enterprise, yeah. right? Bringing them to the moment of truth. It's not just about doing single source of truth and doing offline analytics, but can you bring it to the moment of truth? When the guy calls in to the call center, does the agent have the required context to, to provide him that information, right? And it could get as real time as this. I go on the website, I'm trying to do something, I was unable to do it. Two minutes later, I really want to complete that transaction, I call the call center. If the guy says, you know, Mr. Anand, you, you were trying to just change your price, you know, your uh, rate, rate plan, is, th is that what you're calling about? You want me to complete that for you? I was like, whoa, right? That's an experience we don't have today. And to go from where we are to that, and that's, that's where that is, becomes the common experience, it's still many, I think, many quarters, many years away by the time all of these enterprises really get all these capabilities together. Well then, how do you talk to customers about the trade-offs between 
um, speed, you know, real time, close to real time, not, not quite real time, versus complexity to execute, versus really the value. Do you really need, you know, to do that relative to the value, to the complexity and the difficulty? How, how are people going through kind of that analysis to figure out where to tune those yeah. levers? I think um, the low hanging fruit is what people get to first in case there are like I said, asset protection type use cases, right? If, they, if you don't have your security apparatus in place, if you don't have streaming analytics to detect your security breaches or um, uh, things that are absolutely essential to protect the business, that's where you would go first, right? And there it's a, it's a no-brainer. You, are you waiting to lose that you know, $100 million situation? Or you want to plug that hole right now? It's like insurance, right? right. So you, you first go after all the, the safeguarding use cases, right? And there's not much of an argument for whether it's valuable or not. You really want to do that. The next is, people have done um, Hadoop-related analytics, et cetera, right? Batch analytics, and they've gotten a degree of lift. One large telco said they've got 25 times ROI on their Hadoop investment, right? And now they're looking out for the next big thing. So the CIO and the technology team is, is now proactively thinking, how do I use technology as a the next level of differentiator, right? How do I use, and, and everybody knows about streaming analytics now because they're all bought into Hadoop, and it's a lot more easy to move into streaming because you already, the Hadoop revolution has already taken place, right? You just now are adding a capability on the same stack. So that makes it much easier. So, um, I want to go back to that, that comment you made about there's always more context we can learn about, say, the customer um, if that's the case, we really can't build big packaged apps based on predictive analytics, machine learning. Like, there's, it's not repeatable enough. Um, and I guess that takes us back to where you came from, your, you know, your firm's origin, as in you know, professional services. Um, how do you see the applications or, or the solutions you build evolving? And, what might have to fall into place for you to be able to build repeatable applications as opposed to repeatable tools that you've got right now? Um, I'm not sure I quite okay. fully understood the question. There. Okay, yeah. so um, ERP came from, you know, we knew how to codify accounting and order taking, yeah. you know, inventory control, um, the sales order process, but with um, predictive analytics, we, you know, when it comes to making the next best offer or yeah. a recommendation engine, it's like you have to ask for what and based on what type of information. So it's, it seems to come from professional services firms like, like yours and the tools, but we don't have you know, ERP type applications. Um, does for what, predictive analytics? Yeah, so does that have to change, or what I happens? I think it will, I see that changing. How, okay, how I see that when? changing. So, for example, all the platform players are going up the stack, as we can see, right? Hortonworks is now going up the stack in terms of adding um, a security uh, framework, a security application, cybersecurity application. And it is very, it is uh, the natural progression for all platforms to start getting verticalized to go up the stack, okay? so. Let's say I could, I could bring in all the best practices of, let's say, churn reduction, focused on the telco industry and create a, a churn reduction application, okay? Which, which is a predictive analytics app. Right. I can, I, can, I can package all of that intelligence and with small customization, so it's not yes. coming all, right now you might see 80% customization, 20% product, right. but it will grow to 80% product, 20% customization. But you're still talking about a relatively narrow function. Yes. Churn prediction. You're not talking about the whole OSS or BSS, you know, the whole back office or front office for a telco. You're talking about this one, one, uh, one app silo, right? Say, yes. right? Yes. But that would be that would be in the con if if you want to make it more abstract and larger than that, you could. I mean, customer 360 is something that most large enterprises are now going after as a use case. Okay? Yeah. It receives integral feeds from both on the batch side as well as the real-time yeah, side, right? Yeah. So if you want to go bigger than just churn, it would be the whole view of the customer. 
and I can create a verticalized app for the retail industry versus the telco industry. There'll be some nuances that are different in each case, but customer 360 would be a more broader space, right, as an, as an app. With some customization in, involved, I could easily envision that application being a, a category in itself, right? As in, like the next ERP. Right. So, there are other, for example, the whole security space, there's this fraud space, risk analytics, all of those, those are all actually doable uh, in terms of um, being, being, being apps in their, own, in their own self. The one other space that we are interested in is um, call center analytics, right? We have some very powerful use cases that help call centers you know, visualize the, the real-time performance of what's happening. And this is a problem we have seen that, that banks, telcos, insurance companies, across the board, they all have call centers. And they want to look at that customer. And that is the key moment of truth area where people are interacting with the customer, right? And there are two things in a call center. It drives a lot of costs, right? Every call amounts to like tens or maybe even hundreds of dollars, right, in terms of the amount of time it takes. So large companies are all trying to reduce that cost point. Right. You reduce the cost, and when you deliver context-sensitive service at that, at that point, it becomes, it becomes a double whammy in the, on the positive direction, right? You're reducing cost and increasing customer satisfaction and profitability. So call center analytics is another, I would say, app space that can be verticalized as an app. It can be a, a significant chunk sitting on a platform that's both, both using real-time feeds as well as batch information. So now we're running out of time, but I want to give you the last word. What advice would you give to customers based on your experience with all, all the customers that you're out there of, of where they should go? What's a low hanging fruit? What's your experiences where people have really had some, some su success in getting into this? Yes. Um, clearly the, the Spark revolution is, is here to stay, right? I would say adopt Spark and Spark streaming ASAP because it is definitely going to be the future. We're seeing adoption across the board. Number two, if you think that streaming analytics may or may not be useful for you, be clear, it is going to be useful for you. There's at least like five to 10 use cases that will drive revenues and profits in your enterprise no matter which vertical you are. So go find a platform which can abstract you from the technology, help you to focus on the business, and get you to production fast. And that's stream analytics. Good tips. All right, Anand, thanks for stopping by from Stream Thank Analytics you. from Impetus Technology. Uh, George Gilbert, Jeff Frick, we are here in Midtown Manhattan at Spark Summit East. We'll be back with our next guest after this short segment. Thanks for watching.